This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on December 17th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today we're recording at the Cumming School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University in North Grafton, Massachusetts. And joining me today, my TWIV co-host, Alan Dove. Good to be here. In your neck of the woods. Kind of, yeah. It was only about an hour drive on the Mass Pike, but we're, uh, we're just barely east of Worcester, so it was... Um, not too hard to get. Very good. Good to have you, Alan. We have here uh, a couple of members of a laboratory doing influenza virus research. We have the PI and a few lab members, and we're going to talk about what they do. And let me start with the principal investigator sitting right here on my left, John Runstatler. Welcome to TWIV. Hello, Vincent. Thanks very much. Hey, my, I said it the kind of German way, Runstadler, but you don't, probably don't pronounce it that way, right? I've always pronounced it Runstadler, but All right, uh, we'll pe say people guess a lot of things at pronouncing that Runstadler. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. All right, next to Jonathan. She is a research scientist in the laboratory. Nicola Hill, welcome to TWIV. Thanks so much. Nice to be here. Did you get that accent? Can you guess where that's from? The audience is nodding, but they're quiet. <laughs> Next to uh, Nicola, also a research scientist slash lab manager, Wendy per year. Welcome to TWIV. Uh, thank you. Thanks for being here. I, no, you thank you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> but they were here and we showed up. Well, yeah, so you, you came to us. <laughs> oh, you're, I'm not used to people thanking us. That's yeah. true. All right. And finally, next to Wendy, postdoctoral fellow, Kate. Sawatsky. Hey, yeah, you got that right. Thank you. I try. I'm sensitive to mispronounced names. And someone who is not is Alan Dove because no one mispronounces your name, right? Very yeah. rarely I'll get dove. Dove. <laughs> usually, usually people are pretty good about that. And we dove into it. Speaking of diving into it, we have a little audience here. Uh, very little, actually. Not the smallest audience we've had. Not the smallest. Oh, the first live show. We had one first person. First live show we had one person. <laughs> <clears throat> and let's say, where was that, Alan? Do you remember? Philly. Philadelphia. One person in the audience. Or to say it like it. a local Fulvia. <clears throat> we did it. So uh, many of you people are from here, the veterinary school, right? And some of you are from UMass in Worcester. That's the vast majority of the audience. Comes, <laughs> yeah. comes from, and Jeremy Luban's lab. Welcome to, uh, to witnessing a live TWIP. Have you ever seen one? Yeah, at Cold Spring Harbor. Good to see you again, Jeremy. All right, so back on the front here, the focus. So this is a veterinary school. Correct. The only one in New England, right? That's correct. So can you tell us? And, and this is an unusual location on top of it, right? Yes, it is. So what's the yeah, story? So, what's the story here? Yeah, so this, this is one of the, the newer veterinary schools. Um, and we're on location at what used to be a state mental hospital. Uh, no which, joke, no joking, which, it's inappropriate. Right. <laughs> and um, yeah, back in, uh, well, I guess it probably started back in the uh, 70s, um, but then in the, in the 80s, this was turned into veterinary school uh, operated by Tufts. And um, it's been, uh, been going strong ever since then. And so besides the vet school here, there are some research labs like yours. That's right. You're not a veterinarian, right? I am a veterinarian. You are a veterinarian? Yes, okay. I am, yeah. Nic Nicola, are you a veterinarian? No. Oh, oh. PhD. Yeah, that's the way to answer. Wendy, <laughs> are you a vet? PhD. Is PhD. Kate? PhD. All right. Alan, are you a vet? No. <laughs> that, who's a vet in the audience? Islam Hussein. So we have one. Wow, look at that. Yeah. So there are labs here, and so you can get a PhD here. Yes, you can, right? So we have a graduate program, and obviously the veterinary program is what predominates. So the Tufts University is actually three, actually more than that now, but three um, main campuses. The undergraduate campus, which is in Medford, uh, outside of Boston. 
the um, Sackler School of Biomedical Sciences, which is in Boston uh, as a part of the medical school group downtown, and then the veterinary school out here. And so our campus is in some ways just the veterinary school, um, but there is the graduate program here, and there are several master's programs, uh, both for veterinary students and for uh, students that don't have a veterinary degree. So this is our second TWIV at Tufts. It's kind right. of catchy, isn't it? TWIV yes, at Tufts. Tufts. The first was at uh, the dental school. Yeah. Same. Is that the same location as the medical school? Right, that's downtown, yeah. <clears throat> and this is our second. So we'll have to do the undergraduate campus uh, to make Absolutely. it a trifecta. Yeah. By the way, I wanted to point out this gentleman right here is David P. He listens to TWIP, which is the other <laughs> one of our other podcasts. He writes in all the time with case guesses. We know what he does because he tells us. All right, let's... Um, oh, and today, by the way, we had a tour, right? Yes. Where Very interesting tour of the campus. We saw animals, yeah. non-human animals, yeah, uh, like a horse, a, ca a, a cow with a fistula, the fistulated yes. cow. The fistulated cow, yes. Which is the name of this episode, by the way. No. The fistulated. <laughs> maybe, I, I, maybe not. Yeah, it's, but it's a great title. It's we have to title. keep it for yeah. something. We saw birds that have been rescued. There's, there's all the whole wildlife uh, uh, veterinary facility, which was very interesting. Um, and I noticed in the display cabinets in the front, one of the animals that they, they had, the taxidermy um, in the display, was a, was a loon, which I guess is in honor of the history of the location. Um, so inappropriate. But, <laughs> but yeah, the, the, wildlife, the wildlife clinic was very interesting, and I think we're probably going to talk a little bit about the wildlife connection with the research side as well. And we saw... Um, a, a goose that had imprinted itself on humans. Humans, right? yes, was following people around. Uh, and, and many other interesting things. So thank you for letting us tour your, your veterinary facility. You're welcome. I mean, one of the reasons why we thought that might be interesting is veterinarians are sort of on the front line of uh, um, recognizing disease that may be of public health interest. So from our standpoint, it's great that our veterinary students uh, get a chance to get exposed to wild animals and, and medicine in that context. And it's also good for us here in terms of thinking about the research. So let's start with... Uh, and, and by the way, the, yes, um, the wildlife uh, veterinary clinic here is very interested in um, working with people who want to study viruses or other pathogens that are in the wildlife in Massachusetts because they get a huge assortment of them. And we barely got out the door without being, being forced to take samples of like barred owl urine or something they were trying to handle. Uh, they, they really want people to, to sample stuff. To be fair, you're not off campus yet. No, right. Okay. I will search my car carefully. All right. Are you going to work at right. keeping him honest? Yes? Okay. I'll, I'll do my best. Let's find out a little bit about all of you. Let's start with you, John. Where, sure. where are you from originally? I grew up in New Hampshire, in Hanover, New Hampshire, and um, that's still where my parents live, uh, and uh, was born there. Uh, well, I guess there. if you grew up, you were born there. Well, not necessarily, partly, right? Not necessarily. <laughs> you could be okay. born and quickly uh, whisked away somewhere. Um, no, so I, I lived there until uh, I went off to college at Stanford University. Uh, you didn't want to go to Dartmouth. Well, my brother had gone to Dartmouth. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a great place, but, but no, I decided. You got out of Hanover. I decided okay. to get out of town. <laughs> I went all the way to the other side of the country, uh, but I did come back. Um, Were you a science England's major a at uh, Stanford? I was a biology major, yeah. Did you do any research? Uh, not much as an undergraduate, no. Um, I think as an undergrad, I was, uh, I was just interested in too many things uh, to uh, spend my time in a lab doing research. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't, I think, you know, in some ways it wasn't as common uh, then. Uh, or as then, you're younger than I am. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, didn't I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't either do any research. You're about my generation, and it was not standard to do undergraduate research. Yeah, it wasn't such a thing, you know, for, for graduate school applications. I mean, certainly it would help and so forth. But, um, but no, I didn't do much as an undergraduate. Uh, and it was only after I graduated, um, worked for a little bit uh, in a couple of companies back east here, that uh, I really started realizing that, that I wanted to. 
and I was interested in uh, basic science research. Mm -hmm. So then you decided to get a PhD. Well, sort of. Uh, I decided to get a PhD, um, but I was interested in medicine also. Um, and uh, so I went, I went the PhD route first in a way um, and went up to University of New Hampshire uh, and joined the lab of a faculty member who was there and is now at University of Maryland, Tom Coker, who's an evolutionary geneticist. Uh, and during my first year or so there, uh, decided I really was interested in the sort of clinical side of things and the applied side of research, but I didn't want to leave the research side. So I decided to do a dual degree, a DVM PhD degree. And, uh, so I left UNH with a master's degree, uh, and ultimately ended up at the University of California, Davis to do a a DVM and a PhD together somewhat. And your research was on what aspect? My research was on, uh, um, initially I was really interested in uh, genetics and some of the genetic manipulation uh, that was coming into vogue, uh, transgenics and so forth in the early 1990s. Um, But as I started, so I was in the genetics program uh, as a PhD student and then entered into veterinary school. Uh, And as I went through my first two, then maybe third year of veterinary school, I had enough experience with um, patients and classes in veterinary school, I got really interested in infectious disease. And so I ended up switching labs, although not to an infectious disease lab, to an immunology genetics lab. Uh, and my work as a student was on juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and looking at genetic susceptibility and resistance to a whole variety of forms. That, that disease is a, really a compilation of different forms of disease um, that have different genetic predispositions. Uh, so that, that was as a student. Um, and I knew I was uh, interested in sort of going back to the animal side of things. Um, So after I finished my uh, PhD, which was after I finished my veterinary degree, um, I was looking to uh, join a lab that was doing infectious disease work. Uh, And so I spent a little bit of time still at Davis working at the um, uh, Center for Companion Animal Medicine and uh, in Niels Peterson's lab. Uh, and then got the opportunity uh, and I guess the good fortune to start my own lab up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and I was particularly interested in, in that position <clears throat> in part because it was Alaska and that's a neat place, but, uh, but in part because the university there has um, really strong programs in wildlife biology and in environmental science. And I was interested in uh, bringing what I knew and what I had been doing with uh, molecular biology and looking at um, genetics of hosts and susceptibility and resistance to disease and applying that to situations, collaborating with people on animal diseases in wildlife. Um, And so I moved up there in 2004, I guess it was. And um, that was, as you probably remember, right when H5N1 virus had started ballooning and uh, was became a very hot topic uh, in the public sphere um, and in the research sphere. Uh, and so I was, as I started my new lab there, I was looking for uh, interesting projects that would combine an aspect of infectious disease and wildlife with understanding how hosts were susceptible or, or resistant as well and thought that uh, avian influenza might be an interesting area to do that. Um, so it was actually encouraged to do that a lot by uh, just when I first arrived there or actually maybe it was even the week before, there was a little conference that I went up for, um, that they invited me up for, and Jeff Taubenberger was there, uh, who was then at um, 
at uh, USAMRID, uh, now at NIH, and Jeff uh, encouraged me to work on flu and to go out and uh, do some sampling in the Arctic and see what flu viruses were around. So I took him up on it. How long did you stay in Alaska? I was in Alaska, moved back here in 2011. Went to uh, MIT, so right? Years. Moved to MIT, yep, uh, and was part of the um, uh, comparative medicine group there and affiliated with uh, biological engineering. Um, and uh, part of the interest in the move there was not so much uh, moving from uh, Alaska Fairbanks, which is a great place, um, but interested in building the capabilities of what we were doing. So a lot of the work that I'd started in Alaska was really focused on disease ecology and the sampling that we were doing in, uh, in birds for the most part uh, in the wild. <clears throat> and um, so we accumulated all of these viruses and started learning more about the diversity of those viruses and had a, a whole range of questions that we wanted to get at from a, uh, a laboratory experimental context. And so part of that move was to uh, help us do that better mm -hmm. at MIT. And then you came here. So then I came here. How, how long ago was that now? Uh, so a year and a half. It's very now. recent. And wh yeah. why did you come out here? So in part, um, uh, what we what we do is still a lot of the disease ecology and the, the uh, field work, and um, uh, that wasn't uh, such a good fit at MIT for in a lot of ways. Um, but it is a great fit here um, because of the veterinary interest and the focus of the school um, from both a clinical and a research context. Um, and because we do have, as you, as you guys have mentioned already, um, faculty here, both clinical and research, who are working with wildlife disease, um, uh, as well as the, the research community here. So it's a really nice fit for, for my group and my lab, because we do both research on the wildlife context and the field work that we do, and we also do the, uh, the molecular and genetic uh, bench science, and so it's it's yeah, been a great place for us here. Did you know in Fairbanks Tom Weingartner by any chance? I did not. So he was my college roommate. He's professor there in oceanography. Oh, really? Yeah. Outside yeah. chance you might know him. Yeah. No, I did not run into Tom. Okay. Nicola, we're, tell us your history. My history. It's yeah. I've been all over the map really. So. I was born in New Zealand, and then... I was going to guess West Texas. <laughs> <laughs> My accent is not that messed up, hopefully. <laughs> um, <laughs> so then I was raised in, and grew up um, in Sydney, Australia, and I did my undergraduate at the University of New South Wales in environmental science, and I specialised in zoology. I really enjoyed that. And then I went on to do a PhD, in the evolution of parasitism in marsupials. Um, and so if you don't know marsupials, they are a distinct order of mammals separate from monotremes and placental mammals. And so we looked at parasitism, a lot of cryptosporidium actually, uh, toxoplasma, Ross River virus, various things that were both circulating endemically but were introduced in um, marsupial populations throughout um, Sydney. Which uh, marsupials did you work with? Oh, so I got to work with the brush-tailed possum, which I would like to say right here and now is much cuter than the Virginia opossum, if you've ever seen the Virginia opossum. Um, so, Most things are cute. Uh, I guess that's fair enough. Um, no, but they're, uh, I, they probably fill a similar ecological niche to, to squirrels maybe. And they're very overabundant. They're doing well for themselves in urban areas. And so we were certainly interested in that interface. They would get into people's roofs and rubbish bins and that, yeah, they did very well for themselves. So there was a lot of time spent, and that was my first foray really into um, field work. The long, hard hours of working on a nocturnal marsupial meant, you know, we had to be up throughout the night and checking cage traps and various things and risking getting bitten and all kinds of fun stuff. So um, that was kind of addictive, actually, the field ecology. And then uh, 
around that time I had expertise in a weird and wonderful range of things. So I've always been really interested in molecular evolution, phylogenetics, um, various types of techni lab techniques, but also satellite telemetry and spatial ecology of hosts as well. And it was kind of a good fit for understacking, understanding and tracking um, wild birds owing to the highly pathogenic H5N1 outbreak that John mentioned earlier that was happening in 2005. So Australia is a fairly small place, uh, <laughs> population of about 25 million, I think, last I checked. Um, so if you are interested to sort of branch out, the US was definitely beckoning and there was money going into influenza surveillance and this was a, a great opportunity to travel. Um, and owing to that, I did a postdoc at UC Davis um, and it was also a co-appointment at the US Geological Survey. So more field work continued. And thanks to that, I got to do a lot of international travel. I went to Mongolia and Bangladesh and Egypt and various places where highly pathogenic avian influenza was circulating endemically. And we did a lot of uh, satellite telemetry of wild birds um, and modeled whether they were involved in the spillover with poultry and various things like that. So that was fantastic. And then uh, I've just continued on, on that track of influenza and wild birds. And here I am at John's lab, which I adore. He allows me and many of us, I think, a lot of autonomy, which is wonderful, actually. So uh, we get to do, uh, continue um, doing a lot of interesting research into influenza ecology and evolution together. And we'll talk about that. Yeah. But let's hear from Wendy. What's your story? I am from a very small town on the border of Canada, in Lowell, Vermont. And I grew up there and then worked at the University of Vermont for a little while and went to grad school, University of Washington, uh, Seattle. And there I was studying HIV, viral evolution, and uh, the development of neutralizing antibodies and trying to understand the, the back and forth between the evolution of the virus and the evolution of the immune response in a way to try to inform rational vaccine design was the goal. And did a lot of looking at glycosylation on glycoprotein and the evolving glycan shield. And from there, I went and did a postdoc at Boston University with Ram Gumuluru. And there I focused a little bit more on molecular virology side of things, of trying to understand binding and entry of the virus. So we were looking a lot at dendritic cells and trying to identify novel attachment and entry receptors for HIV with dendritic cells and how it traffics through the body. And after working in that system for a while, I realized that HIV and influenza, both being RNA viruses, there's a lot of ways that the work on HIV informs influenza research. And a lot of the influenza work hadn't quite started to adopt some of the things that were being explored in, in HIV yet. So it was a really uh, natural fit to kind of migrate over into influenza work. And as Nicola mentioned, it was a lot of fun to look at the possibilities of going from not only focusing on the, the very small focal parts of the virus, but also going out to the host and going out to the ecosystem and going out globally and migratory patterns and how climate change impacts the movement of animals and how that impacts susceptibility to disease and all of those different components all coming in together. Uh, so now I somehow find myself wrangling seals every every winter. <laughs> wrangling seals, that could be a title. Yeah, that could work. Seal wrangling. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. All right, Kate, what's your story? Hey, I'm Kate. Uh, so I grew up in Spokane, Washington, in eastern Washington. Uh, I went to the University of Washington in Seattle. Wendy and I have like some coincidental overlaps. Uh, I went there uh, for undergrad. I have two bachelor's degrees, one in English literature, which is, yeah, right? It's fun. Nice. Yeah, I liked it a lot. And then the one in microbiology, fine. Uh, <laughs> And then I went to Boston University, again, uh, similar to Wendy, uh, for my PhD in microbiology, where I worked with Tom Kepler. And I was doing something very different. I was looking at um, immunoglobulin genetics following anthrax vaccination. So anthrax vaccine, uh, we only have one that's approved in the U.S. It is an efficacious vaccine in that it works, but it is not efficient. Um, it takes, it requires five vaccinations over 18 months. And even then you have to get an annual vaccine um, 
thereafter for protection. And so the, the question that we were asking was, uh, as a model of a multiple dose vaccination, which is our most common type, uh, what is happening with kind of our B cell selection, with antibody development and diversification over time, and what maybe makes multi-dose vaccines different than single-dose vaccines? Um, but then I uh, did a slight right turn or left turn, I guess, <laughs> um, because viruses are truly the love of my life. Sorry, Evan. And, <laughs> and so I ran off to uh, study influenza, hopefully, with <laughs> John Runstadler. Um, and now it's really interesting. Uh, I primarily was working in kind of computational immunology. So I have kind of both a wet lab background as, al as well as a computational background. And now I'm getting a field background, which is a totally different world. And I love kind of the combination of all three of them. What sorts of questions can you ask and answer with these different uh, methodologies and approaches and ways of thinking as well? And you're a postdoc here. I am a postdoc, sorry. <laughs> For um, how long have you been here? That would be one year. All right. Yep. So what brought this whole group together is flu. Flu. One flew over. And, right. And now, now you're studying the ecology of flu in the wild, which is a little different from a lot of the flu research where it's all in humans, right? I think some flu labs are wild. Some flu labs are definitely <laughs> wild, but this one, there, actually, right? this one is actually going outdoors. I understand. Yeah. That's We're wild on lo several levels. Yeah, I mean, this, this group is sort of reflective of uh, the research picture that, that I guess I take uh, as um, in the lab. And that's, I think, one of the areas that, that we've maybe been deficient in in the research realm is understanding uh, you know, the pathogens that we study on a micro scale and even an organismal scale, how that scales up all the way into the ecology and particularly for zoonotic pathogens. And maybe reflective of my background and my training, I, I find things interesting at all of those different scales. Um, so that's one of the things that I've, I've, I guess, tried to do with our work in influenza, which started with really the, the ecological scale um, and going out and, and sampling birds and initially, you know, asking questions about how viruses were moving around between hosts and what the patterns were. Um, but thinking about that all the way down, because the context that we're doing our work in is really the context of, of uh, uh, human public health in a way. Um, uh, and understanding how new viruses emerge from these reservoir hosts and may infect other hosts. And so I think to do that, one of the things that, that the field has been maybe remiss a little bit in is uh, understanding things on the, the animal side of that context. And to do that, you need you know, people who are interested in the disease ecology, but then you need to do the, the uh, bench work and experimental work. You need the molecular biologists and the cellular biologists. And now, more than ever, you need people who also have a computational interest. So I've always tried to have people in the lab that, that spanned those interests. Um, Which one of these has a computational interest? So that would be Kate be on the end there. You're going to teach our, them, right? Yeah. You know, so I will say... As a proponent of computational work, um, I feel like getting a, a PhD, you know, the, the classic thing is that it teaches you how to figure out how to independently do research and to kind of be fearless and to learn new techniques. And for me, it happened in both the wet lab, but also at the computer. So a lot of kind of uh, PhDs or people doing research will say, no, 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 I can't do that. I don't know how to code. I don't know how to program. You have to be fearless about it. You just have to dive in and go for it. And they're learning whether they like it or not. <laughs> I always say scientists can learn anything. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. That's right. So can you give us the brief explanation, an elevator explanation? What's the relationship between the flu that we get as humans, either annually or pandemic, and what's in, say, birds? Right. What's the relationship? So the, yeah. So the, sh the short version of that is that we, we think that all of the viruses that are circulating in any of the animals we study, including humans, originally came from birds. And so <clears throat> birds are a, a, the sort of ultimate reservoir, and that really talking about water birds because of we, how we think the ecology of that virus plays out in nature. 
Um, and so if we go out and we sample bir water birds just about anywhere, we find viruses um, just about anywhere we go. And those viruses are, are circulating and evolving uh, in that reservoir host. And occasionally one uh, spills out of that host into a new host. Maybe that happens more often than we think. Um, and occasionally that spillover takes hold and establishes itself and adapts in a new host. So we think that's happened in humans um, as well as other hosts like horses and uh, dogs and seals perhaps. Um, so we have, humans have a couple of different strains that are now endemic in humans and circulate seasonally. Um, and we've learned a lot or had experience a lot in the last 15 or 20 years with viruses that we think may be a threat to becoming a new virus in humans. Um, and 2009, in a way, we did have one of those with the, uh, what, what uh, sometimes called swine flu, uh, sometimes more perhaps accurately called 2009 pandemic flu, um, which uh, emerged in 2009 and spread in a pandemic fashion in human populations and now is essentially an endemic uh, strain and replaced the other one that had previously been circulating. Okay. So what, so you sample various animals, including this guy right here. <laughs> this, this, this That's is a Christmas seal. It's the Christmas Star. seal. Christmas and gulls as well, right? right. What else? Right. So in the birds? birds? Yeah. Short birds. A gull is different from a shorebird. Or a gull is a, a shorebird. Well, yeah, well, that, that's, that's controversial. So a gull can, this sometimes a, it's a seabird and sometimes it's a shorebird. So it's a charidriformes, technically. So they are related. So you can alternate types. explanations and just take turns? Depending on right? who the audience is, yes. <laughs> um, yes. So, all right, so to do that, you have to capture the seal or the bird. And that's what the three of you do? Yes, and do. so you do that. You got you showed us a movie of you go out somewhere really cold and sampling Monomoy Island off the Cape, and then you yeah. come back in the lab and you, you move small volumes of liquids around like we all do. <laughs> <laughs> Except they do it in a freezing cold abandoned lighthouse yes. Yes. with a headlamp. With a headlamp. All right, so so why don't each of you tell us what you've done? It's starting with Nicola. What, sure. what do you do in sampling and laboratory work? Sampling and laboratory work. Um, so when it, in the context of the wild bird. Uh, surveillance work that we do. Uh, yes. I, I typically spend a lot of time in Alaska where we're really interested in um, the mass migration of water birds. So gulls for sure are, are fun and interesting, but they're often sympatric with a lot of other species, which so it often means we're, we're addressing an interspecies transmission question all the time. So shorebirds, ducks, seabirds, various um, various avian taxa, I guess, in Alaska. So it's Alaska's kind of a fascinating place where these two viral pools, which are thought to um, circulate separately, so we've got the Eurasian and the North American lineage of low pathogenic avian influenza virus, um, this is where they kind of collide. And you see a lot of interhemispheric reassortment in Alaska. I mean, a lot of our viruses are usually a mix, eight segments, of course, but usually they'll have um, um, a, a North American sort of hemagglutinin and then a backbone of or internal segments that are Eurasian in origin. So they're really mixed up and we are really interested to address why this is happening and what are the consequences, especially downstream. So Alaska is a place, um, this is the, the subarctic in the Arctic region where we get these mass migrations of birds. Um, and then it's also changing <laughs> rapidly. So we see um, a, a lot of these birds typically um, usually undertake mass migrations, but they're starting to hang out. There are milder winters and we track populations of resident birds um, that stick around throughout the year. And so we're kind of curious about how that feeds into endemic cycles of influence evolution and then how that we see migration from those areas as well. So we do, we've got Alaska various sites in Alaska, it depends what you want to talk about, but one that's close to my heart is the gulls and how uh, they 
are really uh, an interesting group to discuss because they, their distribution and migration and ecology hinges so much on human activity these days, it's almost impossible to talk about the evolution and spread of influenza in gulls without addressing how urbanized um, this species has become. Why is that? Because they eat our garbage? Absolutely. Right. Because they're super smart and they're food motivated. <laughs> and so they hang out wherever there's food to be found. And, and this is just not just Alaska, but around the globe as well. So it's a great, they're a great taxa for getting a handle on how human activity is influencing influence ec ecology and evolution. Um, so we so look at that. How do you uh, sample the how gulls? How do we sample them? That's a great question. So you go to your local 7-Eleven <laughs> and you buy a packet of Doritos <laughs> and you crush it up and you put it down and they will come down. So I've kind of oversimplified that a little bit. We, and then after that, we use a net launcher. There are various ways to get them, but we use a net launcher and that um, it's got explosives, uh, explosive charge and it's weighted on all four corners. And so it charges out and it goes for about, I don't know, 20 or 30 meters. Um, and you can bring them to the bait and then you um, basically net them. And then you go in and you put a sock over their head, which calms them down. And then you can actually go and do. So what parts do you sample? We sample, um, uh, so the oral pharyngeal tract. We also sample the cloaca. We'll collect bloods. Um, we collect a feather for isotopes, morphometrics, and various things, but th that's the backbone of it, yeah. And then you let them go? Of course. And are they tagged so that if you're- Oh, we do that, yes. Catch them again, you'll know. Oh, absolutely, yes. And if you ever did catch them again, would you then take more samples and see what's changed? Oh, please. Totally, yes? Yes, okay. longitudinal <laughs> sampling. Um, right. It's very difficult to do that. I mean, it's a numbers game. So we always put a tag on our on our animals. It's, it's such a rare occasion to get an animal in hand like that. You can't squander it, you have to put a tag on. Um, and so often we get a lot of our ban returns, especially from the gold population from as far south as San Francisco. We rely on a lot of bird nerds to get out there and actually look for our species. So when you let them go, do you say thank you? Uh, <laughs> we, we do our best. Um, they, got they got Doritos. They got a free feed. Um, really, you really give them Doritos, yeah? Um, so that works really well Don't in parking lots in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> in, it, they'll, they'll go for whatever, is, uh, whatever they're used to in their native environment. So mm -hmm. super good for a stop and shop in uh, Massachusetts, say. Alaska, they are used to uh, salmon. The fisheries bring them in. Got it, okay. So that's like- All right, so you collect to. all these samples, yes. right? Put them in tubes, labeled, gotta be really organized. Yes. And then you bring them to a lab. Do you do that in Alaska or do you bring it all back here? Parts of it. Um, so uh, the, the meat of it, we probably do in our lab here. So everything has to be on cold chain because it's an RNA virus which is a pain in the butt, um, but we work really hard to make sure there's cold chain and then we undergo a lot of the molecular screening here in this lab. So we'll do everything from the RNA extraction, we'll do a real-time PCR, then we'll do our culture of the virus in chicken eggs and then whole genome sequencing it tends to happen here, yeah. And in your lifetime, how many goals have you sampled Ooh. this way? In your short lifetime? Uh, Per Dorito bag, <laughs> um, pretty high. So I would probably say approaching a thousand mm -hmm. of gulls. Gulls, I got it. Yeah. Ducks are a different discussion. It's maybe You've done more than that. Maybe, you think? Uh, the lab yeah. has done a hundred thousand okay. samples more than. <laughs> well, so to, bird yeah. in the hand yeah, versus yeah. yeah. So we do lots of we do fecal sampling as well, yes. um, which is on the order of like tens of thousands. Worth, um, worth reminding people that. Birds shed influenza right. in large quantities from the GI tract, yes. and mm -hmm. so we get a lot of samples from fecal samples, which then go through the same which are lab processes, which are much easier to get than uh, Dorito-based. The Earth is really coated with bird shit. Yeah, right? yeah. it's all guano. Yeah, it's, it's full of influenza virus, right? Right, that's right. That's yeah, a lot of it. Yeah, we're trying to figure out. Yeah, so, so besides the gulls, you you sample other kinds of so shore birds, as well, right? Yes. <laughs> what, sorry, what did you say? I like that. It sounded good. What was it? I said your guana encounter it. <laughs> oh. That's why we have Alan Dove here. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. And yes. so, how how many times do you go to Alaska a year? 
Uh, I've dialed back a little bit from the field work, but once a year, and then we have a very committed crew who pretty much sample throughout the year. And then you come back here, you do you do some pipetting and sequencing oh, yes. and all that computational biology? I, I am going to muscle in on the computation thing as well. Yeah, I spend way too much time looking at sequences and phylogenies and trying to do Bayesian modeling of the evolution of influenza, um, which is super fun. So I love the all three together. It's a wonderful Great. package. All right. So Wendy, tell us what you do. I spend most of my time with the SEAL projects. SEALs. With the SEALs. So we do active captures in the wintertime when it's pupping season off of Cape Cod. So the, the gray seals move in now. They're starting to pup now. And they pup from early to mid-December through early to mid-February. And during that time, we basically try to go out as much as we can, weather dependent. But we're going on it's small boats and we're going a ways offshore. So a lot of times we, we get weathered out and we go as much as we can, as, as long as the boats can go. Boating in Massachusetts in January. Hmm. Yep. <laughs> in a small boat. A small boat, yeah. Yep. So we... Uh, we just did a supply drop a week and a half ago or so. Mm -hmm. So we try to go out ahead of the season. We stay in a, a lighthouse. Monomoy National Refuge is incredibly generous in supporting the project. And we stay in a lighthouse out there. And there's no heat or electricity and no running water. And we stay out there for about a week at a time. How many people stay in this lighthouse? It varies. It's usually between 8 to 15 at a time. So we try to go out. With, there's kind of a, a balance between we have to bring not only all of the, the lab equipment and the sampling supplies, but all of our survival supplies as well. So we need to bring out you know, all, of our, all of our water and our food and some source of heat and sleeping bags and all of that. So there's a balance between wanting to have as many people as you can to do as much sampling as you can versus only being able to handle being able to have so many there and, and safely navigate those conditions. So during that time period, it's kind of all seal all the time. We're trying to think about how to get onto the island and do the sampling. And then we come off of that, and then I try to go and help Nicola in, in Alaska for a short period of time and as the spring migration for the shorebirds is going through. And then just about then, we're coming into the stranding season with seals. So then they start to come into the rehab centers, and we sample the animals that come into the rehab centers as well. Usually that lasts for just the front end of the summer, unless you have an unusual mortality event like we had this last year. And then it goes all summer long, and it's still kind of going just as we're getting ready for the next seal season. So in between actually sampling, uh, it's pretty parallel to what Nicola described. So we're bringing everything back in and we're trying to screen for the presence of viral RNA and then attempting to, to try to get isolates to grow and then also doing a lot with serology. So in the absence of sequence, you can also infer what they were exposed to by doing hemagglutination inhibition assays. So we end up looking at a panel of known isolates and trying to get an idea of the signature viruses that they've been exposed to in the past based on what we get from the HI assays. I'm guessing you don't use Doritos. We don't use Doritos. No. So how, do you, how do you get a seal? So it's important to, to point out that it's heavily regulated. So we're not just going out and, you know, accosting seals. We, we are, but under regulation. So there's, <laughs> so there's the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act uh, obviously is in place. So we have a permit that we work under for the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and then also the Fish and Wildlife and the Refuge has a special use permit for us to be out there. So we're, we're going out and it's you know, very carefully regulated with how we're handling the seals. We only are handling seals that have pups that have weaned from the moms, so we're very careful to never interfere with a mother pup pair. And in fact, if, even if there's a, a weaned pup over here, but there's a, a nursing pair over here, we'll steer clear of this one because we don't want to disturb the nursing pair. So we find a pup that has weaned, and then there's, it's literally a, a, like a big canvas bag that you, you get the, contain the seal in the bag and scoop it up and bring it back. And then they're restrained through manual restraint. Uh, and it's just basically- and The seal is not happy about this. They're usually not incredibly excited about it. Yeah. Some are a little more tolerant than others. Some of them are, are, are very vocal in letting you know that they are not pleased about it, and some are a little more cooperative. Um, <laughs> so I, yeah, I, I got bucked off of a seal last year, which was, uh, which was fun. But so we restrain the seal, and then we collect a, a whole suite of samples, because as Nicola was saying, when you have an animal in the hand, especially one that is so heavily protected, we want to try to get as much information as we can. So we have a, a really rich collaborative network that we work with. So we 
take swabs from the animals to look for influenza as well as um, morbilli virus is another common one that we're looking for. And then collaborations looking at other, um, other pathogens beyond virology. And then the blood samples, we're looking for antibodies, but then we're also doing um, cytokine profiles and looking at other measures of immune function. And then collecting whiskers and lanugo, where you can do stable isotopes and get an idea of diet and contaminant loads. So we're looking for um, pesticides, PCBs, mercury, and how all of these things contribute to impacting disease susceptibility with the animals. Um, yeah, that pretty much covers it. And this, this whole process, uh, you showed us a little film clip that um, it's very choreographed and you've got like six people handling this and one person doing this, one person doing this. And you, you said that there's a time limit, right? You've got to complete this whole process within 20 minutes is the, the deal? So we've imposed a maximum of 20 minutes. Okay. So the whole time that we have the animal um, you know, under restraint, we're closely monitoring the respiratory rate and looking for any signs of distress. and other than it being angry that we've, well, we've right, captured yes. it, but it is as under long stress. as it's... <laughs> it's a... <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so if there are any signs of distress, then we release the animal and, and abort the, the sample collection. But otherwise, if we max out, if we get to 20 minutes and we haven't collected all the samples we want, we also stop there. But in a, a really smooth capture, uh, there was one year that John was on what we ended up dubbing SEAL Team 6, because they would capture the animal, get all of the samples, and release the animal in six minutes. So a lot of times it's more Ooh, around that. That's that's really top notch. It's usually more around ten minutes or so. Okay. Uh, ten to fifteen. Once we get past fifteen, I start to get uncomfortable, and then absolutely don't go past twenty. So this is a brief unpleasant experience in the seals' day, and then it's off. Right. And there, I should also mention they also are flipper tagged as well to be able to try to track the animals. I um, could see you practicing this in the lab on someone. <laughs> Right? Get your Minus the flipper tag. Yeah, Minus without, yeah. the flipper tag. <laughs> and and the the really all of it sounds yeah. pretty unpleasant. So you've, yeah. you've sampled thousands of seals, right? I've, one of your papers said 3,000 some seals. Of samples. So we collect multiple samples from a seal. We're, we've sampled about 1,000 seals. And do you ever get the same one back? Uh, not in a different season. Sometimes. So we've oh, tried. Oh, because you're always sampling pups. We're always sampling pups. So we do have, we've had a few that we've sampled on the rookery, and then they, they leave and they go about their business, and then they end up back in the rehab facility a couple of months later. So we, every now and then a tagged animal will come back into rehab, and we can sample again there. And then we've tried, and Mother Nature just does not cooperate. We really, really want to be able to do longitudinal sampling. So we have tried very hard, and we have these beautiful spreadsheets and this fantastic plan that we're going to go, and we'll sample on this week, and then we'll wait a couple of days, and we'll sample again. And they're still there. They don't move a whole lot during that time period before they leave. But then weather comes through, and we end up not being able to get out when we think we want to. So that ends up not actually working. But there has been probably 10 or so we've been able to resample within a season, and then a small handful that have come back in through rehab. So you mentioned before that you haven't been able to recover infectious virus from seals, influenza virus, right? But you get PCR products. And you can sequence it and see the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase types, right, subtypes? So we have not, so it's so low level that we're pulling off of them. Yeah. Because the, the thing that is fascinating to me about it is there have been a number of mortality events that have happened with influenza and seals uh, dating back to the late 70s. And those mortality events have pretty much all been associated with harbor seals. And the kind of... The, common assumption was that it was a spillover event, that it spilled over from wild birds into seals, specifically harbor seals. They had a die-off, and then that was that. So we came into the picture wondering if there was more to the story than that, and is it circulating out there endemically? And that's where we went out to the rookeries. And the gray seals, you don't see outward signs of, of any sort of, of morbidity or any signs of them being sick. So they seem, they're, they're nice and round and robust and they seem like they're healthy and we look at white blood cell counts and that seems the same between ones where we detect RNA and ones where we don't, viral RNA. So it's a very low level infection that we're picking up. As such, it's right at the cutoff of detection and it doesn't allow us to sequence it directly and it has not yet cooperated as far as growing in embryonated chicken eggs or MDCK cells, which are the two standard ways to try to grow influenza. Is every seal infected, though? Is it PCR positive, or, is, or what fraction? It, it varies a little bit from season to season, but it's 
give or take 10% that we detect viral RNA. It's been as high as 15, as low as 5. And then we see pretty consistently about 20% that are seropositive. Uh, this past year, we saw over 40% were seropositive, and that was just at the front end of the mortality event that came through this past summer. So we're trying to tease out whether or not there was a, a relationship there. So, so in gray seals, this is what you're seeing. And in harbor seals, we see these mortality events. The mortality events go through the harbor seals. So seal. then the theory, presumably, is that maybe this is an endemic gray seal flu that spills over to harbor seals? That is one of the, the theories that we're, we're working on. And then that also leads into the question, which is a lot of what Kate is actually focusing on, is the, the host difference. Because harbor seals and gray seals, they, they literally haul out on top of each other. Right. So they, it's not that they're operating under you know, a different niche. They're, they're in the same place. So why does it sometimes exactly. spill over? So we are very interested. What does it take interested. to break the seal? Okay. <laughs> right, right. I mean, we should realize there's a, there's a lot we don't know about this system. We're only just scratching into it. And so the, the, um, you know, and the, the seals are in, as you might imagine, and you could, uh, see very, uh, close association with water birds, including gulls, for instance. Um, and they do have, you know, the different species of seals have different life histories to some extent. So the time that we're sampling the gray seal pups, there aren't a lot of harbor seals around uh, there. What's but the, time the there are, seasonality are of the animals. mortality events usually? Or is there? They have really varied. Okay. Um, but it's more of a summer. There are some issue. that have started in, in September, October, November, and then gone through the season into kind of the spring. And then there are some that kind of take hold in the spring okay. and the summer. So there's been some variation. Do you, so you keep all these samples and you could look for other things at some point as well, right? Right, exactly. So another common one to look at, and again, the dichotomy between harbor seals and gray seals really comes into play, is the morbillivirus, virus, uh, focine distemper virus, is another one that is known to, to cause problems in mostly harbor seals. So for the most part, it doesn't have a very large impact on gray seals, but harbor seals are, are very susceptible. Um, uh, focine herpes virus is a big problem for harbor seals, not for gray seals. Influenza, harbor seals, not gray seals. So these are other things that we are, are trying to look into as well. Is this a harbor seal or a gray seal? That was a gray seal. That's a gray seal. That was, okay. yep. <laughs> that one's dead. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so sad. <laughs> did you find that on the so, beach somewhere? We did. So this came from Muskegon Island. That's another place where we do our sampling. So Monomoy, Muskegon, and now starting Great Point, Nantucket. So this is, you can tell it's a gray because it has this elongated snout. They're also known as horse head. Okay. So they've got this long nose. And you know. now what kind of seal is this? It's a Christmas seal. Where'd you, where did you get that from? Which island? <laughs> okay. So that was from a, a secret island that I can't disclose right. because they're a very protected species. Yankee species. Candle Island. <laughs> <laughs> so Kate, tell us what you do. Yeah, so that was a good segue. Um, so right now, as far as the not field work, I'll just start with, um, I got some money, which is very nice from Tufts, uh, to, <laughs> yeah, to, to oh, start nice. asking this question about the harbor seal versus gray seal uh, potential issue. So, I mean, almost certainly it is some combination of environmental and genetic factors, um, but we don't have genomes for either of those. I was going to ask you that. No That's genomes, like, uh, huh? No genomes. Um, recently, there was a very nice high-quality monk seal genome, Hawaiian monk seal, uh, there endangered people really. Would. But they tend to stay by themselves, those. Yes. Interestingly, they do <laughs> tend to stay in Hawaii in seclusion. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so one of the really great things about joining this lab in particular is that both Wendy and Nicola have set up these excellent collaborations and have very strong ties. Um, so I was very easily able to get access to high quality gray seal and harbor seal uh, tissue and samples. Um, so what I can do on my side, which is literally happening as we speak on a server in the cloud, <laughs> uh, is I'm putting together, hopefully, some nice high quality genomes for both of those animals. So right now we have a harbor seal going. And, and the idea is to take kind of a naive look at it, say, if I am just looking at, if I'm doing a direct comparison of these two genomes, what is different between them without respect to any specific immunogenetics or anything? Um, does, you know, there could be other genes in play. And then uh, to kind of 
hone in on potential ortholog families between them that are expanded or contracted or have diversified more in one than the other um, to see if we can start to predict maybe something that might be protecting them. And ultimately, this is hypothesis generation. This is not the answer in itself. But we also have this wet lab facility that we can then go on to test it because, again, they have these amazing collaborations. We can get kind of primary cells from these animals as well to start testing that. Primary seal cell lines. Cool. That's the dream. That's the dream. <laughs> I was so gonna so you're running the SEAL Genome Project, and you're sure. going to try and compare these and maybe develop cell lines that might help culture virus? That is the hope. Okay. That's really the really, really That's hope. kind of the long, yeah. the long view. Yeah, and that's also yeah. another interest of getting the sequence off. So we were, right. uh, or getting the sequence out there. Um, we were talking earlier about how there's really very little SEAL uh, influenza sequences published on NCBI. If you look, including partial segments, there are 90 total. This is not full virus. This is individual segments. So influenza is made of, of course, eight segments. Um, and then when you look at complete ones, there's 24 complete segments. That's all we're working with here. So if we could get something like that rolling, that's, that's what I'm, that's the second thing that I'm really trying to focus on getting, you know, more influenza sequence out of our seals that we have lots of. Um, as far as the fieldwork component goes, I completely am a hanger honor. I ride their coattails. Uh, this has been my first real field work. Uh, I, I did some West Nile, West Nile virus uh, work in King County during the time when we, you know it was still coming over to the West around Seattle, and I picked up dead crows, and that was about it. So now I'm dealing with live animals, which is a different situation because they bite. <laughs> And so I went out with Wendy and the crew uh, for seals. The seals are very frightening. Uh, I'm, I'm good with the back end. The front end has sharp teeth on it. <laughs> but it's been great to kind of come in with an outsider view, a very naive view, and see how efficient and how incredibly uh, careful everyone is with these animals, with these really big, strong animals. You don't think how strong a pup would be, but they're very strong. Uh, on the opposite end, I also went to Cordova uh, with Nicola and uh, helped out with short. Cordova, bird. Alaska, not Cordova, Spain. Sorry, Cordova, <laughs> Alaska. I actually <laughs> forgot that there are two of them. <laughs> um, looking at uh, the, these wonderful, adorable little sandpipers and plovers and things that really, if they bite you, it does not matter. And I <laughs> loved doing that field work. <laughs> that was great field work. Big fan of little birds. By the way, the, in the Wildlife Center, they have a lot of bird illness due to West, West Nile. Yeah. Yes. If you want to go back to studying that at all. I am happy to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so there's an, another thing that we're working on right now. Um, I kind of incidentally got to kind of lead on this one with our UME. Uh, so there is an unusual mortality event going on right now. Um, and we worked out that it is focine distemper virus, kind of that's the primary cause here. And it just so happened that both of these two were on vacation. <laughs> they were just leaving on vacation at the moment we got all of these samples in. So our excellent tech uh, Alexa went up to Maine to do the dirty work of the necropsies to send me the samples. And I stayed in the lab just at crazy hours trying to process and figure out, because at that point we had no idea what was causing this UME. So trying to figure out what it was, we got to PDV pretty quick. I think I sent out a Slack message at like 2 a.m. going, it's PDV. <laughs> um, and as part of that process, uh, we were able to get some next generation sequencing done with these samples. So the really great thing is that we now have a complete PDV genome from these seals, which is, as far as I know, only the second one that hopefully will be published very soon. Uh, contact me if you want it. <laughs> and um, we also, beca because at that point we were just trying to do a big pan uh, check to see what it could be, we also have potentially microbiome data from the, or we do have microbiome data from these seals. So I'm really interested in kind of what is in the virome, what is in the biome of all of these under-studied uh, animals. I'm sure you'll find lots of picornaviruses. I'm yeah. sure I will. <laughs> now, in in seals, um, in, in birds, flu is a, Gastro a gastrointestinal. Um, in seals, is it respiratory like it is in humans? So this is largely an area <laughs> that's developing and we're, we're working on figuring out exactly what is going on. As far as how the virus is shedding, that's still something that we're working on getting more information on. But we do take swabs from rectal swabs, conjunctival swabs, and nasal swabs. We pick up positive samples from all three of those sites, okay. but primarily from conjunctival and nasal. 
So it seems like it is most likely a respiratory infection. And then you do end up seeing clinical signs of pneumonia that, That's, okay. that is also obviously indicative of respiratory. So we can also pick it up through the rectal swabs, but I think it's primarily a, a respiratory infection with them. Okay. Yeah, you'd expect it to be in a mammalian host, which it, right. which it usually is. But I mean, we should point out too that, that um, we tend to talk about avian influenza as in birds, but there are what, 10,000 or so species of birds? So we're really talking about a really complicated birds ecosystem. Birds are a big group, yes. Right? And so in some of those birds, we do know it's, it's, it has a respiratory component as well as a uh, GI component. And the, the uh, converse is probably true to some extent that in mammalian hosts, there's some component that maybe is GI and maybe more so in some species than others. And maybe other systems too. So we do, you know, as Wendy, I think, mentioned, we uh, do get signs that there's influenza virus in the uh, conjunctival samples we take from the seal's um, eyes. And uh, these guys maybe have some thoughts about um, how viruses are being transmitted if they are in that population or at least exposed to. I mean, we said there's a lot we don't know about this system and and one of the things we're really curious about and why we sort of got into it in the first place was because of this association uh, at least environmentally uh, if not biologically between uh, seals and birds and um, yes there may be infection with the seals but there also just may be a lot of exposure yeah. um, and so those some of those seals could be developing an antibody response but not being infected, but they're being exposed either through conjunctival or respiratory uh, epithelia. Um, and so that's something we'd, we'd certainly like to understand um, from a spillover and a sure. uh, virus. So I wanted to ask Nicola that does, I mean, you don't sample seals, but do you think gull viruses can infect seals? Have you ever seen evidence of that? Or? Yes. Yes? We, we have. Definitely a lot of empirical, empirical data. Uh, um, there's certainly um, a, a case of an H13. So there are, gulls are a weird evolutionary outgroup when it comes to birds. And there are two subtypes, hemagglutinin subtypes, that are strongly associated with gulls, H13 and H16. Um, and we have seen evidence of H13 infecting a pilot whale and have full genome sequenced from that. So we know that that's clearly an interface in these coastal ecosystems. So these events do happen, and it's, it's a matter of how and when, I guess, and predicting when it will happen again. Well, then also with the hemagglutination inhibition assays, so even though we haven't been able to get sequence from the seals, we do have a, a large collection now of seropositive samples from over the years, and we can test what form of the virus they recognize. And it it changes over the years, and there's a, a broad range of subtypes that they recognize, but the one that is consistently picked up in almost every seal almost every year is against H13 or H16. So otherwise, people would tell you that it's a, a gull-associated virus, with the exception of the one random pilot whale. Uh, but it seems like well, you know, maybe it's more of a How much a sampling coastal. is there in pilot whales? Right, exactly. Not much. Not much. So how do you think the seals transmit to each other? So there's several different ways that are possibilities. One is, is direct coughing and sneezing at each other. Uh, so especially during you know, the breeding season, they're getting right up in each other's faces and being very aggressive, and it could be through that mechanism. But as far as the, the interface between birds and seals is concerned as well, influenza will survive for a while in the environment. Um, it's not necessarily representative, but in a perfect laboratory condition, if you put it into you know, pure water and 17 degrees Celsius in the lab, you can put virus in there and pull it back out as much as two years later. So it, it will survive for at least weeks, months, possibly even through a season environmentally. So it could also be that it's shed, whether from a bird or from another seal, and then they're you know, crawling along and inhale through that mechanism. So those are the two of the main ways that we think about but then we also see even potentially fresh water as an interface. So the two main sites that we sample off of are Monomoy and Muskega Island. And Muskega, there's a small freshwater pond there. 
which is frequented by both birds and seals, and influenza could survive in that environment. And we, we do see that we have a higher prevalence of influenza that we're able to pick up off of the animals from Muskegon as opposed to Monomoy. So there's a lot of different ways that you can explain that, but one possible explanation is that that freshwater source is preserving the virus and allowing it to transmit to the next host that comes swimming, swimming through. So Nicola, what about bird-to-bird -bird transmission? How does that happen? Oh, yeah. So birds are just this optimal host for influenza circulation. So you, you take a host which uh, forages or it dabbles, if you want to get technical with um, terminology, in water. So they're attracted to wetlands and they're feeding on the, the inverts and throughout the water column. And because it has a um, fecal oral transmission route, all they need to do is shed it and then whoever else is dabbling in proximity or downstream may get infected. Then you add on this layer that there are, they are these long distance hosts. They migrate long distances and so they're able to mix and mingle and their migration is punctuated along the way with these stopovers at various wetlands. So they're distributing, have the potential to distribute the virus over really long distances. And they migrate in flocks. They migrate in flocks. So yes, they whole, attract each other. Yeah. Flock of seagulls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Be a good name for a band. Yeah, would be. Oh, <laughs> on a roll. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's why they call them dabbling ducks? Correct. Huh. And yes. they're a big host of uh, influenza viruses. Huge. Right? Yes, yes. If, if I mean, mallards, there is a dogma that mallards are really um, one of the primordial hosts for influenza virus because um, they, well, they have, they shed quite high titers of the virus and also are subclinical. And then they just have, uh, um, because they're water birds, it's this process of coevolution. Or shore, shore birds. What's that? Or are they shorebirds? <laughs> you know the answer. <laughs> um, so, um, yes. So this, this definitely, um, that, that's almost, well, it's very well established, I think, in the field of influenza now that if you're, if you're going to go out and choose a species of bird that you will definitely get bird flu from, choose a mallard. For sure, but to the point where GenBank is saturated with mallard um, influenza sequences and we're kind of curious about influenza diversity and interspecies questions. So other species therefore come into play and that's important. All right. Do you ever find human influenza virus sequences in your samples, like gulls or seals? Gulls or seals, yeah. <laughs> so collaborator Walter Boyce at UC, uh, UC Davis, he did a study, uh, when was that, 2010, of northern elephant seals in kind of mid-California and was able to find the 2009 pandemic H1N1 in that population. So the evidence in the phylogeny suggests that it came from humans and whether it was, the assumption is that it was probably runoff, a storm drain runoff, and then it, it flushed into the coast and then caused established infection in that host. Reverse spillover. Reverse spillover, yeah. Yes. So that's the only time that it's been documented you as far as seals. Your HI data, though, from uh, our samples. So then again, with the the HIs, looking at, um, I didn't mention that we've also done some sampling off of Sable Island, which is off of Nova Scotia, and that's the largest gray seal. Comp uh, that's through that's collaboration. A tough place to get to. It's a really well established research site, though. They have right. they okay. have been doing incredible work there for a very long time. So they were kind enough to do some sampling for us and send it down okay. for us to, to pool into you our study. You didn't get to go? I didn't, but it's not completely off the books for possibilities in the future. So it's on my wish list, John. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. Just going to throw that out there. Got to pay the helicopter fare. Right, right. right. <laughs> Keep a wish list. Yep. So one of the things that was really interesting right, is if you look at the antibody response in the population of animals off of Cape Cod versus the gray seals off of Sable Island. Sable Island is very remote. You have to, it's a long ways offshore. Cape Cod is not lacking in people. Sable Island is northeast of Nova Scotia or east? It, it's, it's out in the Atlantic. It's quite a bit. Off of east. Nova Scotia. East, yeah. east off, yeah. Yeah. So we detect um, antibodies against H1N1 in the seals from the Cape, and we detect absolutely no evidence of it seals off of Nova Scotia, off of Sable Island. So that 
is also suggestive that the animals are, are perhaps being exposed to H1N1 here as well. Kate, if you could uh, sample a T-Rex, would you do it? <laughs> I would sample a T-Rex? You would? Who's going to restrain? Oh, to actually restrain. No, I'll, take, I'll process the sample. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not what I meant. No. I want you to I go out. I can't even handle a baby seal. Uh, yeah, that's why I asked you. I it. <clears throat> John, um, Islam wanted me to mention this paper, yeah. uh, which he's the first author on. He, it's called New England Harbor Seals h 3 N8 influenza virus retains avian-like receptor specificity. Can you explain what that is all about? Yeah, so, so this is one of the questions that we were, um, that sort of got us interested in the seals as a potential host or uh, more of a reservoir host than a spillover host. And that was um, in 2011, and I'm, uh, I believe you guys talked about this once upon a time, oh, yeah. too. There was mm. this uh, outbreak that was in the New England area here. Um, I think it was uh, just 162 animals that were documented or sampled for that. But out of a few of them, there was an influenza virus that was pulled out that was ultimately uh, fingered in a lot of ways for, as the cause of that uh, epidemic. Um, or unusual mortality event, as Noah dubs it. And so as we got into um, thinking about sampling the seals uh, past that and during times that there weren't epidemic events, we were also interested in, in uh, this virus and an understanding um, with a virus like that that spills over and is actually causing mortality uh, in a host like a seal, which is a mammalian host, um, how can we evaluate the threat of that potentially um, as a human pathogen. And so there was, um, the, the, that virus was sequenced uh, and it had some mutations in it. So it, it looks a lot like a bird virus, um, but it has some mutations in it that are, uh, signify mammalian adaptation. Mm. These are polymerase mutations, right? Yeah, uh, polymerase mutations and uh, a couple other segment uh, segments as well. Um, but the polymerase mutations are of particular interest because those have been shown to be important for those uh, host transitions. Um, so we were uh, interested in assessing that virus uh, in a little more of a uh, uh, host uh, specific context. And so uh, Islam at the time uh, uh, was working in the lab. Um, and uh, he was interested in looking at the, the uh, polymerase mutations and understanding whether they um, uh, were uh, a significant source that would make that virus seem more uh, of a human pathogen or not. Uh, so he did some, uh, some really nice work um, to uh, uh, develop uh, assay for that and look at polymerase function uh, and then look at a whole variety of mutations uh, that were uh, apparent in that virus and also the ones that are apparent uh, at those uh, positions in nature um, and really try to understand uh, how all of those together impact polymerase function, at least in terms of the assay, which was for replication rate, um, and then uh, evaluate that uh, in terms of what's circulating out there in nature already, um, and whether those, those are uh, ones that we should perhaps put on the list is uh, important. The, th the fact that it still recognizes what alpha-2-3 is the avian signature of sialic acid, right? That means it hasn't adapted to the mammalian. But you, yes. what you mentioned earlier about eye infections, there's alpha two three in the eye, right? So maybe yeah. So so that that um, you know that that still is something that's uh, a uh, sort of standard information that we go by. You know, does a virus bind more alpha two three sialic acid or alpha two six? But of course, the since that that was first described using um, uh, using some avian viruses and, and human viruses, which do have a very uh, specific binding for those, um, those sialic acid attachments, that picture has become a lot more muddy in a lot of ways, right? So from the host context, 
closer look at the tissues that are involved in, say, swine uh, infection or human infection or um, avian infection have showed that in a lot of cases there's a real combination of sialic acids that are present in those tissues. And then as we looked at more, people looked at more viruses, you really see a range of specificity for those viruses. So some are very 2-3 specific, some very 2-6, and some are in between. Um, and so that was part of uh, this study as well, was looking at how those uh, that seal virus in particular um, how well it did at, uh, or the hemagglutinin from it did at attaching to uh, mammalian host, or um, we looked at uh, ferret uh, and human uh, respiratory uh, tract epithelia, and looking at how well that virus bound to those uh, those host tissues, and in fact. Um, Actually looked a lot more like, uh, frankly, like a, like an H1, H5N1 virus that bound well to tissues low in the airway in the uh, alveolar spaces and not very well to the upper airway tissues. Um, and that's one of the theories about how H5N1 virus, uh, has infected humans in the cases that it has is that it, it, um, in certain situations has gotten deep into the airways where it's able to uh, attach. And so we theorized that, you know, this virus, while it had some mammalian mutations, um, it, was, it was sort of somewhere in between uh, in the context of uh, polymerase function and not quite there in the context of tissue attachments. So it was a transitional uh, attachments. form, essentially. There may be a transitional form, but... but uh, and of course, we we couldn't really uh, test this. But right. The idea was that maybe if that a virus like that, and maybe there are others that are circulating out in nature, if they did get deep into a human or a mammalian lung, they might also yeah. cause a, an infection that would be a problem. So, so as you all know, uh, polio is about to be eradicated, and we have to stop working on it. So if there is ever a universal flu vaccine, does all this have to stop? What do you think? So that's so the answer is no. <laughs> but it's for a reason, right? So uh, we all hope that there's a universal flu vaccine and that it's uh, tremendously effective. Um, and there's some really interesting approaches to that being uh, tried certainly by uh, some of our colleagues, including your old mentor. Um, uh, and so those may be successful, uh, and even if they're partially successful, they may improve the current human flu vaccine a lot. Um, but they won't change the fact that there's an enormous amount of flu diversity that's circulating in reservoir hosts. And so part of the way that you evaluate whether a universal flu vaccine is universal is by understanding how universal it is. So I think we'll always need to, to um, understand what's circulating in nature, and I think the chance of eradicating influenza um, is much lower than eradicating polio. I did my PhD on flu, and I had always intended to go back to it because this was 1979. It was early days, right? But we made this infectious clone of polio, so that was very seductive. I had no, no clue that polio would be eradicated. Otherwise, it would have gone back to flu. It's not too late. You yeah. can come out sampling with us It is January. too late. <laughs> <laughs> I'll save space on the boat. Do I'm not sitting on the seal. Not sitting on the seal. Oh, you let's haven't lived until. So. <laughs> um, all right, just, I have just two quick questions for all of you. Um, I'll start with you. Have you read any good books lately you can recommend to us? Yeah, you can start thinking, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I have. Uh, I, um, I'm forgetting the titles. <laughs> the, uh, I lately read the, um, the book, The Story of the Ship Essex that Moby Dick hmm. is based on. Anybody You've remember that title? That, yeah, yeah. Um, Oh gosh, heart of the sea. Heart, heart of in the, the heart sea. of the sea. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's correct. That was um, good. 
Nathaniel and, Philbrick, I think. Yeah. Yep. Wreck of the whale ship. Huh? Yeah. Wreck of the whale Tragedy ship. Tragedy of the whale ship Essex, something like yes. that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fantastic. How about you? Uh, how about you, Nicola? That's an unfair question. I, I mean, my <laughs> bedside table is like a stack of yeah, these books. It's sort of stack. aspirational, yeah. right? Yeah. And wow. Um, I think the last book that I read um, was Zadie Smith on Beauty, which I adore. Mm. If you, it'll completely get you out of your science bubble. It's incredible. And it's sort of set in New England as well. And she's a fantastic author. Would you say it's inspirational? Oh, it's harrowing. It's everything. Um, I don't know if inspirational is the right way to, way to put it, but at all. Yeah. How about you, Wendy? <laughs> I have a seven-year-old daughter, and we are <laughs> deeply entranced in Harry Potter right now. So currently, um, I'm on book four of Harry Potter. But when I'm not reading with my daughter, I guess the last thing that I read was um, Soul of the Octopus, which was a good book. Okay. Um, I, otherwise, children's books. So I had a, a, a panelist on TWIV in Zurich, and she said, well, I have a young daughter, so all we read is kids' books. <laughs> she can read any exactly. adult books, too. <laughs> Kate, how about you? Yeah, I read an excellent book recently. Uh, we are in the beautiful state of Massachusetts, or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in New England, and I read the book Vacation Land uh, by John Hodgman about Maine aka Vacation Land. It is a poignant tale about the pain and the glory of this wonderful area. And I, I think we can see uh, parallels between the pain and the glory of that and things like seal sampling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, have you read any good books? I have a book recommendation for this entire group. The Worst Journey in the World. <laughs> Absolutely Cherry Garrard. Oh, yeah. It's a, um, it's not a thin book, It's uh, but it's... Um, the story uh, written by one of the survivors of the um, uh, the Scott expedition <laughs> to the South Pole, well, and his good. the worst <laughs> the worst journey in the world was the section of it that he did where they went to um, uh, the Emperor Penguin Rookery, traveling across the Antarctic ice with yeah. completely inadequate equipment because they were idiots in packing. Um, he doesn't phrase yeah. it that way, yeah. but they, um, yeah. familiar with yeah. that problem. So it's <laughs> bring that up for field work. Yeah. Something to read while you're planning your next field Sounds like expedition. Sounds read it in the lighthouse. You might <laughs> read that in the lighthouse. That would be yes. a good one. There's, that also reminds me. There's a, a book that came out recently called Field Work Fail. Oh, and it's, it's kind of like one pagers of, derived of, from the Twitter thread of the okay of real stories of yeah. things that have. have Interesting scenarios happening in the field. That, that's a, a fun. I actually thing. finished another real good one called Bad Blood. It's Bad about Blood. the story of the uh, Theranos. Oh, uh, yeah, great. Yeah. So. All right. Good. One more question. RNA or DNA? <laughs> RNA. 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 DNA. <laughs> you just wanted to be different, right? I just like host genetics. <laughs> it's, fine. it's fine. It's fine. It's interesting. Because most people parallel their viruses. But in Zurich, an adenovirologist said RNA. And I, was, and I asked him later why. He said, it all started with RNA. Yeah. That's interesting. I agree there. That's a, I got to say, I, I stole that from Goggles Optional, mm -hmm. another podcast. <laughs> All right, that's, that's TWIV, the special episode here at uh, Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine. You can find all the episodes on your favorite podcast player, whether it's on a phone or a tablet. Please subscribe to TWIV. You get every episode automatically. It helps us to show numbers of lots of people listening, so please do that. Send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. And if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for the different ways that you can do that. My guest today, our guest today here at Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine in North Grafton, Massachusetts, Jonathan Runstatler. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for being our guest too. It's a cool bit of work you do and... Um, Hope you can keep doing it in a long time. Yeah. Hope they don't eradicate the flu. <laughs> well, no. let's not go that far, but... Uh... <laughs> Wendy Perrier, thanks Very for joining us. Thank you very much. I've gone out of sequence. I know yeah, that. Yes, yeah, the, the names are in the wrong order in the doc. What do you like better, sampling in the field or pipetting in the lab? 
You know, honestly, it, it both. So okay. you kind of get tired of standing at the bench. And Whichever you're not the doing at the moment, you're most fond of. Each one is great for a while, and then you kind of get tired of it. You're like, okay, I'm ready to go back to the bench. Like, all right, I'm ready to go back to the field. So it's it's a nice balance. Nicola Hill, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you very what much. What do you like better, field or lab? I will say the the field ecology. Yeah, that's where for me that's where the glory is. I've been reading a lot of uh, David Quammen lately, and he talks to a lot of field people. Right. He interviews them because he, he he thinks that's all science is actually. But but for him, <laughs> he likes yeah. traveling and going outside. Yeah. And he'll go into the woods with someone, and you know it's really interesting. Yes. And I always thought I never did any of that. Right? <laughs> uh, maybe the next life, I should do it. Kate Sawatsky, thank you so much. Thank you. What do you like better? I genuinely love those little sandpipers. I had a great time in Alaska. <laughs> They're cool how Alaska. quickly they run, right? They're wonderful. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah I watched them on the shore. <laughs> Just and the sweetest little birds. And what are the ones that fly really low over the waves and really fast? Are they sandpipers too? They're about this far off the waves. <laughs> on the East Coast. Maybe sandalings, if we're talking about shorebirds. Shorebirds, or yeah. yeah. I love them. They go up and down the coast. Yeah. Yeah. Really oh, cool. Pipers, yeah. All right. I want to thank Islam Hussein for arranging this. You mentioned this a long time ago. And actually, we talked about one of your papers a long time ago on Twitter. He gave us some pictures of you guys wrestling seals, which yeah, appeared. We didn't talk about sort of how this came, came about, but uh, I... Uh, how was, what came about? I, this this podcast in particular. Oh, there's a story? Oh, there's sort of a story. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I was, uh, I occasionally load up TWIV on my long commute. Occasionally? Well, <laughs> you, you've got a lot of competition. No. Uh, and <laughs> <We don't. laughs> not, in the, not in the genre. <laughs> there's no virus podcasts out there, right? I, I, no. No. Uh, what else is important? Uh, I'm sorry. Well, so you, were listening, you were listening on the road. I mean, we could, we could do another podcast on that, couldn't we? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But uh, you had a question from a, uh, so that somebody wrote in yeah. asking about influenza in seals. And so I got to the lab, I said, and I heard that. I said, hey, you know, do we want to respond to uh, Twiv's question? And uh, I had CC'd uh, Islam on it. And, of course, as... Um, uh, as one of your super fans, he had already written a, your, the response that was like three pages long that included video links and everything in it. And uh, so, yes, thanks to Islam yeah. as well. I appreciate it. Thank you so much and picking me up. And I'm staying with him at his house. Made Egyptian meal last night. It was great. Thank you so much. Um, Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Short trip back home. Yes. All right. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank you. <laughs>